Good morning, guys. How are we doing? Good. Let's, uh, let's pray before we get started. Dear Jesus, we just thank you that, uh, thank you for this beautiful morning. We just pray that this morning is a morning of restoration and rest, God, in you, that we could take this time in worship just to meditate on the amazing things you've done, Jesus, and what you're doing for us all the time, God. We are so thankful to have a good, loving Father like you, God, and we just want to give it back to you this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Bye. 
Jesus. Let's take this time now to greet each other.
Yeah, pretty much. And that's usually the case with me, the speaker. But. Good morning. Oh, there we go. Good morning. Precious saints, how are we today? Fine, that's it. Fine and great. Blessed, wonderful, excellent. Well, we survived the heat to some degree. It's only supposed to be to some degree. I didn't mean to actually say that, but 97 degrees, we can handle that, right? Uh, let's go through some of these uh, announcements. Pr uh, first of all, if this is your first time, we are delighted you're here. Um, we would like to get to know you a little better. There's those little blue cards, which I did not bring up with me. Uh, it gets us to know you a little bit, know more about you. Yeah, you get that. And it's also good for a free item of your choice. Uh, so we'd like uh, to get to know you. Anyway, stick around if you can. Uh, we have a prayer meeting, meets next Sunday, August 7th at 8.30 a.m. Uh, the men's breakfast is Saturday, August 6th at 8 a.m. Please sign the sheet uh, back at the foyer because we need to know how much food to make for people. Uh, we have the baptism, which is coming up. This is a save the date for August 28th. That's in about a month, 2 p.m. at the home of Rod and Bonnie Washington. If you have any questions about that, you, of course, can ask Pastor, and also there's a sign-up sh sign sheet for that also in the back. Uh, we have had yet had no ushers uh, to no ushers in waiting on the invitation to uh, come help usher, so we're still looking for those, if, if you can do that. Uh, we do have a praise report in that. See, look, I even have, I have a, a star thing, and I got little balloons there and everything, because we give thanks for our new teacher in the Sunday school, first through third grade, praise the Lord. Yes, so that's wonderful, okay? Okay, that's enough. Now, uh, men's Bible study, we are wrapping up the book of Daniel. Okay, so Daniel chapter 12. So we will be moving on to a new book soon, but uh, you, of course, more than welcome. Better late than never. The Bible bus is finishing up the book of Job. So you'll do the second half of Job this week. And the youth, of course, have a Bible study at the same time. So that's on Wednesdays. The women's retreat is uh, definitely coming up. The registration is officially closed today. So see Angela or Wendy if you have a last-minute sign-up, but it should be wrapped up today, paid in full, put a bow on it today. That's the plan. So uh, women's study, our last meeting, will be August 4th. More info to come regarding the fall studies. And what might be the last announcement, food ministry. We are still looking for a strong individual that can hopefully help come once or twice a month to unload and load the, the food truck there. Uh, it's on the Fridays, 7.30 to 10. So we are looking for someone if you're strong, or even if you're not strong, it would still be nice. So also we have a few handouts here that are also at the back foyer. We have a new Calvary Chapel magazine. I got these things falling all over the place. And uh, Louis pillow has got a new uh, pamphlet up there as well. Jeez. Anyways, we have the ushers come forward for this morning's offering. Heavenly Father, we again come before you. We thank you for this time, this opportunity. Uh, we defer all of our hopes and dreams and everything we have uh, to you because we know that we were purchased by your son's blood. And so we can only say thank you and praise you for the rest of our lives. And so we do ask that you would bless these tithes and offering. Use them for your glory, we pray. And we thank you for this beautiful day in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so we're going to be reading out of Proverbs 11, and it's verse 16 where we're starting. So if you guys just want to turn to that or just listen, either one. A gracious woman gets honor and a violent man gets riches. A man who is kind benefits himself, but a cruel man hurts himself. The wicked earns deceptive wages, but one who sows righteousness gets a sure reward. Whoever is steadfast in righteousness will live, but he who pursues evil will die. Those of a crooked heart are an abomination to the Lord, but those of blameless ways are his delight. Be assured an evil person will not go unpunished, but the offspring of the righteous will be delivered. Like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. The desire of the righteous ends only in good, the expectation of the wicked in wrath. 
One gives freely, yet grows all the richer. Another withholds what he should give and only suffers want. Whoever brings blessing will be enriched, and one who waters himself will be watered. The people curse him who holds back grain, but a blessing is on the head of him who sells it. Whoever diligently seeks good seeks favor, but evil comes to him who searches for it. Whoever trusts in riches will fall, but the righteous will flourish like a green leaf. Whoever troubles his own household will inherit the wind, and the fool will be servant to the wise of heart. The fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and whoever captures souls is wise. If the righteous is repaid on earth, how much more the wicked and the sinner.
Thank you, Jesus. God, it's that simple. Just worshiping your name is, is what we need to do. And it's, uh, there's so much freedom and restoration in that. Just giving you praise and, and giving up ourselves, God, to give you honor and glory. So, God, we pray that we do that as we continue in worship and the, and the word, God. Just pray for Pastor Ken that he just brings the heat. In Jesus, let me pray, Lord. Praise God. Oh boy, I'll tell you. Okay, a good report here. In July, Food Bank served 279 families, 660 adults, 200 children for a total of 860 people. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you. Teamwork. And we didn't serve one day. So it would have been more if we had, had served that one day. Uh, so praise God. Teamwork. It's incredible what can get done when we put our heads together and our bodies together and our hands and feet and we're, we become the body of Christ in motion. Amen? Just awesome. Fireworks. We, we, um, we sold like $2,500 less than last year, but we made more money than we did last year. Yeah, we made about 9000 yeah, and the reason is because our expenses were less. Last year we had some uh, capital uh, investments that we had to make, a uh, humidifier and different things, and this year we had less, less things we had to buy, so we actually made more money, praise God. And so, you know, we have our funding for reaching out with the food bank and Union Gospel Mission and just all different other kinds of things uh, where we reach out to the needy. And speaking of which, we... Reached out to Hansi and Jeanette, and they're very thankful. $2,200 came in for, in that offering, that love offering for uh, their bills, medical bills. Uh, we, Hansi has asked for prayer. Uh, there are still issues as Jeanette recovers from this major surgery. And uh, so let's lift her up in prayer. Lord, we come before you, and we lift Jeanette up. And Father, there's still some infection going on, but the doctor said that that's normal for all that she went through, the trauma uh, the intense trauma that her body went through in, that st in those two surgeries, that to have a little leftover infection is, is just calm and normal. But we speak against that, and we agree with Hansi that his wife will make a full recovery, and they'll both be back into ministry. 
We praise you and thank you in your name, Jesus. Amen. Okay, there's been a rumor going around that Dolores Rogers is in the hospital. She is not in the hospital. She was in the hospital a few weeks ago, but she did not go back to the hospital. She's right down the street at Pine Creek Care Center uh, on Kirby and Sunrise, right next to the Roseville Care Center. So please know, it's easy to visit her. She's very close. All right, this morning, the message is building the house God's way. Building the house God's way. Lord, I come before you, and I, the heat is on me. And Lord, I'm nervous because I know that this passage is traditionally one of the most understated passages in the Bible. It's not given the immensity. It's not given the credit. It's not given the place, the space, the position that it should have, Lord, when it's preached. And Father God, I come humbly just asking that the Holy Spirit would allow me to be able to convey the importance, the significance, the, the grandeur, the incredibleness, the awesomeness of this passage. And Father, it's, it's humbling, it's overwhelming, the thought of trying to convey it, and to, to be sure I've done my job, as appointed, as called to do. And Father, let the Holy Spirit speak, and let the hearts be open and the minds open and understand. We pray this in your name, Jesus. Amen. We're in Matthew chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. I mean, 1 Corinthians, Matthew. I was just reading Matthew in there. I have a, a scripture from Matthew. It, it's Matthew 10, 42. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, I tell you the truth, he will never lose his reward. That's a scripture. Now, that's very, that's pertinent to, to what we're going to be looking at. I'll read it again, Matthew 10, 42. And whoever gives only a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, I tell you the truth, he will never lose his reward. Never lose his reward. And we're going to be talking about rewards in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. I'll read chapter 3, verses 9 through 15. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, you are God's building. You can read the, a sentence, a verse, and put a different accent on it. This one, it's for we are God's fellow workers, uh, Paul speaking of himself and Apollos, and you are God's field, you are God's building, speaking of the church. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, to Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is what? Jesus Christ. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it, because it will be revealed by fire. And the fire will test each one's work of what sort it is. If anyone's work which he has built on it endures, he will receive a reward. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet so as through Fire, the heat. In 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 9 through 15, Paul compares the church, the body of Christ, which we just talked about being the body of Christ as we disperse food to those who are in need. He compares the church, the body of Christ, to a field and then to a building. He stresses the quality that we should strive for while building each of the three stages of the church, the three stages of construction of the house. The first stage, verse 10, is laying the foundation, laying the foundation. Here, I love the foundations here in Sacramento because 99% of them are, what are they made of? Concrete. They're slabs. Now, you go other places, and back east, for instance, where buildings are older, and a lot of times, most of the time, they're, they're wood. They're, they're, they have 
concrete um, anchors and, and concrete, I forget what they're called. What are those things called? Those, what is it? Piers, you know, the, the, the things that the wood go into uh, that are sunk into the ground. Um, but they're, I love these cement foundations, these concrete foundations, because they just fit in so perfectly, built on rock, built on concrete. The second stage of actual construction. And then there's verse 12, the final inspection. So there's the foundation, there's the building that goes on the foundation, and then there's an inspection. In this picture, the Apostle Paul illustrates some of the nuts and bolts of Christianity in the form of constructive, and it is constructive. Many people think it's, it's criticism, and it certainly appears as criticism very easily because Paul is slamming them. Last week, he slammed them. He said, you're babies who can only drink out of a bo baby's bottle. And, you know, that kind of, you know, but, but he does it with love. He does it with a heart to, to help, a heart to grow grow them a heart to get them to where God would have them be. And it's not destructive. It's not criticism. It's constructive instruction on how to assemble, how to put together a healthy, thriving body of Christ here on earth. How to build the house of Christ God's way so that it will pass, it will ultimately pass the inspection and be rewarded. Because we can have a house, we can have a, a church, we can do all kinds of things, but our passage is going to tell us it doesn't mean we're going to end up with reward in heaven for it. It doesn't mean we won't. We're going to get into that. It all starts with we are fellow workers. We looked at teamwork last week, a field of workers, if you will, working together, building the house together in unity. And we looked at some of the sins of of, of, of that can strife, envy, jealousy, uh, comparing teachers, all kinds of things that Paul hit on, and it leads into this passage. But we know that we need to build the house together. Last week, we looked at the importance of together, of unity, of not looking at all that's bad in the church, and many people do that. Many people are disillusioned with the church, and many people stop coming to church become the, because they become disillusioned. And basically, the church is not the building. Not basically. The church is not the building. The church is the people in the building. But someone says something to them. Someone does something to them. They create their own agenda that they want to see implemented into the church, and it doesn't happen, and whatever. But they get disillusioned, and they end up, you know, oh, I'm out of here kind of deal. And so we need to build the church on Christ, and we need to be workers who are in unity and can get beyond ourselves. That's a basic principle that's very important. Building the house together. How God uses different workers with different talents. And Paul's telling them, he's saying, why are you splintering into these factions? Why are you doing that? Why aren't you working together in unity? And he would ask the Corinthian Christians, Apollos and I are in this together, and we both have a part to play, and so do you. What's your part? We simply plant and water. And it's God who works the miracle of germination and makes the plants come up. But what's your part? Each person has a specific part. As Corinthians unfolds, we're going to see there are the different members. There's the hands, there's the elbows, there's the arms, there's the armpit. No, not armpits. So much. There's, there's the head, and, and we talked how if, if a body doesn't have a head, it, it's, it's a freak. It's, it's, you know, a chicken without a head running around. And, and we have all these different positions and, and places, and not one is more important than the other. We looked at how a quarterback on a football team would be annihilated if it were not for team play, if he didn't have the, the defense that protects him from being slaughtered when that ball is hiked, and he's got it, and he's either going to run or throw. Well, if there's no one there to stop the, the, the offense, he's, he's going to be in the hospital. That's all there is to it. Maybe not in the first play, but by the, by the, by the first quarter, certainly. Now, if you don't think the Lord uses different kinds of people to do his work, ask Ezra or Nehemiah. Oh, by the way, I'm going fast. I have to. I have so much material to cover in such a short period of time. Now, when I do these things, I've always got, not always, but there's people, oh, he's drinking too much coffee, or 
Maybe he's dropping some speed pills or something. You know, it's crazy. It's insane. No, I have to go fast. I have a lot of material to, to cover in the short time. In Ezra chapter 9, verse 3, Ezra had brought a group of Jewish men out of captivity in Babylon in order to establish a priesthood in Jerusalem. Now, many of us remember that in the Old Testament when Ezra did this. Brokenhearted he was because he discovered that they had married heathen women. When he arrives there and to do this, to re the rebuilding, he, he finds out that the Jews have married heathen women. And what does he do? He plucks out his own beard in sorrow, tears the beard right off his right off out of his flesh. Now, years later, Nehemiah also came upon the Jews who had married heathen women. But what did Nehemiah do? In Nehemiah 13, verse 25, he didn't pull out his own hair. He was a smarter guy. He pulled their hair out. <laughs> now, there's Ezra 9, 3. There's Nehemiah 13, 25. Who's right? Ezra? who in his broken-hearted tenderness and sensitivity plucked out his own beard, or Nehemiah, who plucked out the hair of the others? The answer, they're both right. God used both, for in both cases, the people repented. Some people were sensitive and tender and pluck out their own beards. Others are strong and expressive, and they pluck the beards out of others. But the important thing is, does it get the job done? And because the Lord uses all different kinds of people to accomplish his purposes, I can be who I am. A lot of pastors, the, their major problem is they try to get up and be someone else. They, they try to be like Chuck Smith, like we've had guys in the past decades of the Calvary movement, and some actually talked like Chuck Smith. They had, you know, they, they, they mimicked his, you know, they emulated him, and it's good to emulate your heroes, and for sure, but when you start talking and, and you sound just like him, the accent and whatnot, well, that's, you know, be yourself. We don't need to sound like, like, like Greg Laurie or Charles Stanley or whatever. Just, just be yourself because being yourself is enough, you know, and, and, and don't be all concerned about who you're not. Be concerned about who you are and letting God use that and pour that out, this whole thing of self-worth, self-esteem. That's what it's all about is people trying to be somebody else or not being happy with who they are. God made you. He made Ezra. He made Nehemiah. He made all of us. And he uses all different kinds of us to accomplish the building of the house. And I can be who I am, and I can appreciate the brothers and sisters in the church that may be of a different flavor than I am as we labor together. And it's important in the spiritual realm, the house of God was birthed on the foundation of Jesus Christ. And that's the unifying factor, people. It's Christ, it's the cross, it's Christ crucified and resurrected, risen. That's what it's about, and it's about the Word of God, the Bible. Paul tells the reader, you are God's field, you are God's builder. And that day, a field was for what? for plowing, for farming. This was an agrarian society, a culture. They re related to these different th descriptions that Paul was giving them. And when he said, you're a field, they, they, they didn't think of a grassy field out there. They thought of a farm field. And you're a building. Well, you're a house. You're a building. And Paul's telling that, them that day. Feel like you've been plowed a bit last week, people? Any of you feel like, you know, your field has been torn up? It's been plowed aggressively. Plow, man, when plow goes through the field, it, it tears it up. That's what it does. It tears that field up. Well, don't be surprised because you're God's field. And he's not going to just let it, let it lay dormant and not grow anything, not be productive, not have fruit. He's going to plow it. And then he's going to seed it. The good news is that when the field's when the field gets plowed, it means something excellent is about to be planted in you. It doesn't feel like it when that plow is going through the, the hard soil and, and, and making the furrows. No, it doesn't feel like it. It feels like you've been run over by a, a plow or a tractor. And though, although in Genesis 1-1, we read that God created the heavens and the earth. In Genesis 1-2, we read that the earth was without form and void. 
Not good without form and void. And what happened? Well, many Bible scholars with, with whom I agree believe that it was between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 that after launching a rebellion in heaven, because there's always rebellion, there always will be. Sin brings rebellion. And there will always be rebellion. Well, after the rebellion in heaven, Lucifer was cast to earth. And the result was that that's when our planet became without form and void. That's my opinion and the opinion of many others. Now, there's other opinions that that's, that's not when it happened, but that's how I, I, I see it. Now, in Genesis 1-3, what do we see? We see God recreating the earth as the Spirit moved over the face of the waters. God had to get rid of those things that needed to be getting rid of before he could then move. He had to make it a void. He had to make it without form. And then he came in and recreated. And so, too, I su suggest to you, if you wonder why your life has been overturned, and it's a mess, in your opinion, and plowed, if you feel like your world has suddenly, or maybe gradually, your, wor your world is without form and void. Take hope in the Scripture. Take hope in God's promises. You know, it happens. That's how life is. Happens to me. You know, the G Lord builds me up, and then I get too built up, and then I start getting, you know, oh, yeah, you know, God's man. And then the next thing, you get torn down. But you get torn down, not to, because God's tearing you down, and then he's, you know, oh, that's done, let me move on. No. He, he brings you back down to a place where he can plow and replant and regrow. And it's a cycle. It's a cycle of earth. It's a cycle of living. It's a cycle of, of the church. It's a cycle in the family. It's the way it works. If he's turned the topsoil of your life upside down, get ready for something wonderful. He's in the process of recreating that which will supersede all that you enjoyed previously. Now, he shifts from his analogies from agriculture to architecture. First you're plowed, got to be plowed before you can build. In verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me as a wise master builder. Paul's, he's not boasting here, people. He's just saying it as it is. As a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. For no other foundation can anyone lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Paul is wise only for one reason. A wise foundation layer for one reason, because he laid the foundation on Jesus Christ. The foundation on which Paul built was not principles, but a person. Jesus Christ, Matthew 16, 18, upon this rock will I build my church. Jesus said that. What rock? The rock of Peter's confession that Jesus Christ is, that Jesus is the Christ. Now, some have taken that and twisted it to say that the rock was Peter. And it was Peter, but it was Peter's confession there in Matthew 16, 18. His confession that Jesus is the Christ. Now, when Peter said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God, you're the hope, the promise, the one, Jesus had a foundation which to build his church. Jesus had a foundation, the true church of Jesus Christ built upon him. Amen? It's not, let's get to, you know, it shouldn't be, and today with churches being built on business plans, corporate business plans and whatnot, and, and not that they don't become successful in numbers and, and, what, and, and whatnot, but, but it's not let's, to get, let's get together and make something happen. Or let's launch a moral crusade. Or let's be socially responsible. The foundation is based upon Jesus Christ. My hero, your hero. My savior, your savior. Amen? Our friend, our coming king, our counselor, our provider, our protector, the one we put faith in, the one who, when your field has been plowed and you feel destroyed, you feel like there it is, it's still barren, it's just nothing but dirt, he comes along and puts seeds into those furrows, and those seeds grow. 
into a great building. Anything else, the other things are products of something else, not a right foundation. In verses 10 through 11, we learn how to build on the right foundation. Paul explains, according to the grace of God, which was given to me. It's not my intellect. It's not my education. It's not my abilities. It's not my giftings. It's the grace of God. It's the calling of God. That's how Paul recognized what was going on. According to the grace of God, which was given to me, to Paul, as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation and another builds on it. But let each one take heed how he builds on it. There are different ways to build. You can even have the foundation Christ, but then you can come along and build incorrectly. You can build in a way where the inspector comes. The inspector says, yeah, well, you put the building up. It's here, obviously, and it looks good, but now when I go through it, it doesn't pass, in, pass inspection, does not get the final, cannot be used. It's useless. It's of no use. Until the inspection, until it passes the inspection, and gets the final, the yes, 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 everything done correctly. Just constructing it, building it, is not enough. That's how it works. According to the grace of God, though, we have the grace of God to make it so that we do have the ability to pass inspection. Now, the section that follows is not addressed to the one who waters. It's not addressed to the one who teaches or who ministers because the superstructure is not in my hands. The superstructure, the, 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 nut, the, the, the bones of, of what gets built is, is in the body's hands. It's in Christ's hands. I can't do this myself. You know, I could get up here every week and preach to an empty sanctuary. I could, you know, tell the poor, tell the needy that there's going to be food on Friday and Saturday. But what's going to happen when, when there's nobody to do anything or there's no one to help? There's no team, or the team's fighting and not getting the job done, whatever. They're all splintered. Oh, yeah, well, if this guy shows up, then I'll, I'll do the work. But if this guy doesn't show up, then I, I, if this other guy shows up, I'm not going to be, you know. Well, how's that going to work? The superstructure is in the hands of the believer in God who's authorized us to erect the building, the house, his house, the house of God the house of Christ. In verse 10, Paul's careful to state that his ministry is according to the grace of God. He's humble. Yeah, he's going to say, I'm the master foundation layer, but he's humble because he prefaces it with, it's by the grace of God, by the grace of God. God's calling, which God has given me, is what he's saying. And we can't take credit for who he is or what he's accomplished because it is all God's grace. And likewise, you and I have been called to serve God in this process, in this project, in this plan, if you will, of building his house here on earth. And we've done it. We've been doing it for close to 39 years now. We're almost 30 years old in the fellowship. Started out in my living room in North Highlands, in our living room in North Highlands with three people. Not a big reception. Moved up from West L.A. and you know, we had 18 folding plastic chairs, and we didn't know if it would float, but I didn't have a doubt it wouldn't. I just didn't leave room for that. Why? Because I was called by God, and I knew that, and that's all I ever <laughs> really had faith in. If I had known differently, I would have never moved from L.A. Honestly, I would not. I would have stayed in L.A. because I had been offered a beautiful church in, Santa Ma in Venice, actually, down by the beach in West L.A. that was paid for, it had just been remodeled, redone, the parking lot redone. The pastor's office had a private shower and whatnot. It had a base pay of $30,000 a year. That was from the denomination. The It would be like Calvary Chapel giving us $30,000 a year for the pastor. Calvary doesn't give anything, for the, not even a dollar. And I had, but that was what we were offered that two weeks before we left. But we said, no, because we're called to go to Sacramento the calling, but it's by the grace of God because we were stupid, we were idiots. In the world, a correct business decision would have been to say, hey, sorry, Sacramento, we're not coming. I mean, who would have cared, three people? <laughs> it wouldn't, wouldn't have been a big outrage. You know, our reputations wouldn't have been destroyed. 
three people. But Paul intends a wider meeting, a broader meeting than, than today's architect, who's only a designer of blueprints. After all, Paul has personally done the construction work of laying the foundation. And once again, the foundation is Jesus Christ, him crucified. In the Greek, in the original language, it's architecton. And it's a skilled church planter who wisely constructs on a strong foundation. The foundation that the architecton builds upon is verse 11. It's, it's the cornerstone. It's Jesus Christ. And when Paul came to Corinth, we know from chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, that he came determined to preach only Christ and him crucified. And that's what he did. Jesus Christ, him crucified, and resurrected. Now, the foundation is the most important part of the building because it determines the size, it determines the shape, the longevity, and the strength of the superstructure. And ministries may seem successful for a time, but if it's not founded on Christ, it'll collapse, it'll disappear. We've had hundreds and hundreds of churches, I mean, probably a thousand churches, literally, uh, since we've been here, I'd say at least a thousand, that have started up and are no longer here. People came from different places, and a lot of them like to come to this area because for some reason they don't go to South Sac to plant their church. They, they want to come to, to you know, Roseville and Granite Bay or whatever. I, I don't know why, but that's how it seems. But they don't float and because the foundation isn't, wrong, isn't right. It's wrong. And the time test is an indicator. Do you make it through the four seasons? Do you make it through the thick and the thin? All of you here, we've gone through the thick and the thin, and we're here. Praise God. Amen? Throughout those decades, we continue, continuously stayed on track. And we've had our share of trials and tribulations, up and downs, but we never have given up on our calling to be the Calvary Chapel on this block. We do what we do because we love Jesus Christ. That's why we do it. Do we make mistakes? Of course we do. Constantly we make mistakes. But the, the thing is that when we're in unity, when we're working together, even when we make a mistake, it can turn out good. And even when, if we're not in unity, if we're not working together, and we do the right thing, it can turn out unsuccessful because we're, we're not working together. That's how it works. Amen? We do what we do because we love Christ and are committed to his glory. To the, degree, to the degree that Christ is the foundation and bedrock, to the degree that we make him the foundation and bedrock, we will be successful, at least in God's eyes. We're not the biggest church in the world. And out there, you know, we've had a, a local guy who inherited a large church, and he made the statement, oh, if, if you don't have a church of 250, well, that's not any good. And, you know, that man, it, the, the heat came on him quick enough. And he repented. He said, I don't know how I said that. I don't know why I said that. That was so wrong. But he did say it. And I've heard things like that said before. And it's just plain wrong because in God's eyes, that's not the worth of a church. And it's worth noting that Paul urges us to be careful how we build. The word how is pos. It emphasizes the method and the manner of building more than what is done in that building. And, of course, we're not talking about the building, the walls. We're talking about the building, the people. Amen? And the point seems to be it's not how much we do for Christ, but what we do and more how we do it. It's the quality over the quantity. It's not when people say, oh, but, you know, you do so much work in that church. No, it's how we do it. Are we bringing attention to ourselves? Are we constantly bickering? Do we have our own agendas, or, it is, or is it a selfless service to Jesus Christ? Are we looking for praise? Are we looking for thanks? Or if, if we are, well, we're never going to get enough. And Paul is urging them to make sure that they have it right, make sure that they're built on the rock. And the Bible always has the answers to questions. What's the next step? We've got the foundation. We've laid it. What's the next step? Well, next step, right materials. Got to have the right materials. He's concerned that we build quality. 
The church doesn't belong to the preacher or to the congregation, actually. It's God's church. It belongs to him. Amen? It's his house. Not my house, not your house. It's his house. But then because we're in his family, we get to live in the house. But, you know, our name's not on the deed. The Lord's name is on the deed. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation, on, if anyone builds on this foundation, because there are conditions to building. There are codes. There are rules. If we're going to build the local church the way God wants it built, we have to beat these conditions. Now, if anyone builds, here's conditions. Now, if anyone builds on this foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, each one's work will become clear. For the day will declare it. The day, capital, notice, uppercase D on this, the day. There's a day, not any day, but the day will declare it because it will be revealed by fire, and the fire will test each one's work. The fire will come, the heat will come, and it will test each individual's church, not just the, in, the church in its entirety, but each person in that church. And that's important because you get enough faulty stuff going on, enough wrong motivation, enough wrongdoing, and the building will be shaky. It will have dry rot. And so it needs to be that each person is cognizant. Each person thinks about what they're doing and knowing that their work will be tested as to what sort it is. Quality. At first glance, it looks like there are six different kinds of materials here for building. But there's really only two basic materials that we find here. Costly or cheap. Are you building on the cheap or are you building on the costly? That's the bottom line. Imperishable, perishable. Permanent or temporary? Are you building something that is intended to be permanent or temporary? Gold, silver, precious stones are quality materials worthy for construction on the foundation of, that Christ put down. God put the foundation down. Are you going to come along and build some, some cheap thing on it? Some crummy, dilapidated thing that's going to last for you know, planned obsolescence. It's there for 10 years, and then it you know, needs to be torn down. No. You put something solid, something good, something fireproof. Paul laid a foundation on Christ that was fireproof. And, but he's saying that you can lay foundations that aren't fireproof. And that's the wood, hay, straw, the inferior, materi inferior mat materials that aren't really fit for construction on the foundation that Paul laid. These materials are the perishable stuff of human wisdom that finds the gospel foolish. The focus is on the quality of the building. Paul urges us to use the best long-lasting materials, not temperable, not flammable. And what are some examples of these two kinds of materials? I'd suggest to you that a heart of service and love, that's all you have to remember. A heart of service and love is like gold, silver, and precious stones. And that's what we have here, man and woman. We have people who have hearts of service and love. That's why we, that's why we were successful at the fireworks. That's why we're successful with the food bank. We have such a high percentage of people who serve in this church compared to the average. The average church, 10% of the people do 90% of the work. Here it's more like 50% of the people do the work, at least 50%. Now, spiritual laziness doesn't work. Just let others do it. Or I'm a concept per person. I like to you know, say what to do, but then when it, I don't want to do the work. I've done my time. Well, those things are like wood, hay, and straw in God's, God's sight. Generosity from love of the Lord, the Lord, and with his people is gold, silver, and precious stone. Self-centeredness and stinginess are wood, hay, and straw. Coming to him with a loving heart of worship is the former. Coming to him to impress others is the latter. It's not, you know, oh, yeah, I did that, and man, yeah, I do all this stuff around here. No, that just, it, that's going to burn. I mean, it's not that stuff doesn't get done. It's not that people don't benefit. It's just that you're not going to get a reward for that. That stuff's just going to go up in smoke one day on the day. 
on the day, that's going to be the one day, doing things under your own strength. Now, here's something to chew on. There are things that will have practical value in heaven, and the rest will not be needed. In 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, love suffers long and is kind. Love does not envy. Love does not parade itself, is not puffed up does not behave rudely, does not seek its own, is not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth, bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. But whether there are prophecies, they will fail. Whether there are tongues, they will cease. Whether there is knowledge, it will vanish away. Today we are so focused on knowledge in the church. We get to to be... Well, it's all about how much we know about the Bible. Well, you know what you really need to know about the Bible? Service and love. Being a servant and loving others. That's what Christ did. That's why Christ went to the, to the cross for us. And I'm going to give you examples of things that knowledge will no longer be, a, be in play or have current practical value after Christ sets up the kingdom and there's a new heaven and a new earth after the last day the things that will be behind us. Here's some things. And these, for many, are like so constantly discussed and parsed and argued about and time spent on them. Here's some things that really aren't going to matter when we hit heaven. Knowledge of predestination theories is going to be pointless. You're going to be at your predestination. It's going to be heaven. So why do you need to talk about the theories? Doctrines of salvation like Calvinism and Arminianism. Knowledge about resurrection timing. You're not going to care because you're going to have been resurrected. Knowledge about Revelation and Daniel and the prophets. Knowledge of Israel's place in the end time events. Knowledge about the beast and the false prophet. Knowledge about the timing of the rapture. Knowledge about overcoming sin strategies. Now those things are all good here on earth. They're things that you know help us to get through the journey here as pilgrims and sojourners, but when we head heaven, those things are going to be a puff of smoke. Also, knowledge about how to use all the ministering gifts of the Spirit, they're not going to matter anymore. The things that will be like gold, silver, and precious stone that endure forever are growth in self-sacrificial love. And that's something that is being lost in this country. It's lost as far as serving your country. It's lost as far as parenting and your family and sacrificing for your children that's why there's the bumper stickers i'm spending my on some really super expensive car or a boat being towed i'm I'm spending my kids inheritance because it's not about sacrificial giving sacrificial love it's but the the good stuff's about our faithfulness our humility our service to others and the words In in the words, everything that happens in the inner transformation of the human nature, growing in grace through the Spirit remains forever, people. The rest of the stuff won't. Now, it's not that you shouldn't drive a car. Of course you should drive a car. It's not that you shouldn't know about predestination. Of course, you, you know, that's good to know about. But it's just that you don't get caught up in them. Your focus, you want to be servant. You want to be loved. That's what the focus is. You know, if we're serving the poor, the needy, and we're treating them like trash, that doesn't work. We can give them filet mignon each week, but if we, if we don't treat them with respect and honor, then, then you know, it's better to, to give them hot dogs and respect them than to give them filet mignon and not. Amen? That's what God would have us do. Love them. And our giving the food should come from our wanting to love people and to help them with their needs. Now, it does, and it's not that we say, oh, well, you know, all this food we give one day in heaven, it's not gonna, we're not even going to be eating it, so it goes up in smoke. It's irrelevant. No, there is a relevancy. But the true relevancy is our hearts. Growing in grace through the Spirit remains forever. Pastor Chuck would tell us, you can fake the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's easy to do, and it oftentimes happens. But faking the fruit of the Holy Spirit is very difficult. That's a, hard, that's a hard act, to continuously fake the fruit of the Holy Spirit. 
And I've never forgotten that. I'll never forget what he, those words when he said, first time he said them, and then he repeated them at different, always at international pastors' conferences. Knowledge won't get us anything in heaven, but we can't send our knowledge forward, but we can send our service, our generosity, and our love. A wealthy woman died one day and went to heaven, and an angel then took her to her heavenly abode, which was a plain, old, ordinary building. Right next door to her was, a gar- was her gardener who had a palatial mansion. She said, how did my gardener get a mansion and I get a plain, old, ordinary, torn-up cabin? The angel said, well, we only build with ma- the materials you send us. If you're sending junk, us, junk up here to heaven, junk is what God uses on your house. He uses only what you send him. The time to plan for tomorrow is today, people. We want to be sending the good stuff up, not the junk. And Paul wants to emphasize the truth that the builder of the Corinthians church will, verse 13, one day have their work, even their secret and unknown activities. Their motivations will be judged by Christ Jesus. And as a result, each person will be rewarded according to his or her efforts in building the church or will lose reward. But the day of testing will take place at the judgment seat of Christ, at the Bema seat judgment. It will take place. That is the day, uppercase D. And the purpose of the testing is to give an examination of the worker as to the nature of the work. Not a condemnation of the worker as to his faith, or her faith. In this context, we're dealing with work and its reward. And it is reasonable to understand that loss is in relationship to reward. The worker's loss is referred to the measure of potential reward that they might receive, or the losses that they might endure, they might experience for burned work. Had the work been deemed good, it would have remained. If it's deemed not good, it burns. And Paul tells us there's a fire that'll come and only quality building survives. The fire usually means hell or judgment. In this case, it's the judgment. And it refers to the unbelievers. It, it, when, it, when it refers to the unbelievers, it does mean hell. But when referring to the Christians, it means our judgment at the time of, of the beam of judgment seat and for eternity. Now, in this context, we see gold, silver, and precious stones that are remaining, and we see wood, hay, and straw turned to ashes. Now, the reason that our works have to be put to the fire, put to the heat, is because in the natural, it's hard to tell the difference. Here on earth, it's really hard to tell. We see the works, it looks good, and it's hard to tell whether the work was really w- with the right motivation. It, you know, you feed people, they get food. It looks right. But it doesn't mean that we're going to get a reward because you could just be doing it because you love feeling above everyone else and you love the credit that the, the poor, oh, thank you so much, and, and, and you're, you're just eating that stuff up. But Paul's not confident not always confident, at least, when he comes to separating junk from gems. And, you know, when I think of it, I think of a picture. I've always had this picture that all my stuff, all the things I did are going to be shoved into a big furnace, a big oven. All my prayers that I prayed, were they, you know, vain prayers? Were they repetitious prayers? Were they praying just because, or were they heartfelt? Were they meaningful? The Bible studies, you know, whether I've given them or, or listen to them or whatever, the witnessing. I've always thought, well, it'll all go into the oven and then, you know, it'll come out in the fire and the ash. But because John speaks of Jesus' eyes as flames of fire in Revelation 1.14, we know that we will see him. And the look he will give us will warm us as it melts all the junk in our lives that drew our attention away from ourselves, attention to ourselves or to impress others, his eyes will do that at that time, and it'll leave the gold, the silver, the precious stones of what we did only for him on that day. Now, will a believer have nothing left? Will some believers get there? No, because Matthew 10, 42, and whatever, whoever gives a cup of cold water to one of these little ones, it doesn't say what the motivation will be. 
in the name of a disciple, I tell you the truth, he will never lose his reward. So there will be, we'll, we're all going to have stuff, people. We might think that, you know, some are someone we don't like, that their stuff's going to burn when it's torched. But you know what? A believer might have nothing but a large pile of flammable, flammable material, but when torched, there might be some nuggets of gold be, fa be found in that straw. Amen? You can't tell until you burn away the straw. And then there might be those who, who we think, you know, will have nothing but bricks of gold, but when it's burned, we might find that it's nothing, what looks like a brick is nothing but the end of a wooden beam that has the same shape as a brick of gold. And only the fire will separate it. If you've built or sold a home, you know the importance of the final inspection of that day. You can be confident. You can think you have it right, but you're still going to be nervous. You're still going to be saying, oh, the inspector's coming. Let's, what, is there anything left to do? Is there anything that's not right? Until he, you finally get that fine stamp in the end, right? Your personal life, your marriage, your family, your job, it's all going to come under the scrutiny. And why? Well, it's a serious thing, the materials that we use. It's a serious thing. If, anyone, if anyone's work which he has built on it endures, remains, you get a reward. The word if is e in the Greek. In both verse 14 and 15, it means absolute truth. There will be an if, if you get it. It's not a certainty. For sure, it's an if. And he uses the individual. Paul states that each individual bears the responsibility for that contribution. He will receive a reward, means we'll get some kind of reward. Now, it's not clear exactly. Some say it's more privileges in heaven. Others say it's a better position closer to the throne. You know, different thoughts on, on what it might be, but it's not really clear. But whatever, you know what? It'll be good. Our position's going to be good. Our privileges are going to be good. We're not going to be like missing out and feeling bad because, oh, so-and-so is closer to the throne. No, we're all going to be in heaven. And some say it's perception that you'll be able to, to appreciate it more. Well, you know what? My, my grandkid, you put him on the floor with a pot and a, 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 you know, a steel pot and, and a wooden spoon, and he hammers and drums on it. Man, he's happy, as happy as any person on earth can possibly be. Well, maybe we'll, some of us will be in heaven and we'll be sitting down and banging on something and making noise, but we're going to be as happy as my grandson when he does that. Amen? And it's not going to matter. Or maybe somebody's going to be out. Maybe. These are all maybes. And these are other people's maybes, not my maybes. Maybe someone's going to be out there polishing the gate and someone else is going to be polishing the throne. Well, you know what? They're both going to be happy they're polishing because they're both there. Amen? And I don't think... When I get there, God's ever going to ask me, how many people did you preach to on each Sunday? No. But I do expect to be asked questions like, how faithful were you to my word? And I think you're going to be asked questions. Did you honor my name in your business? Did you teach your children the truths of God's word? Did you love your spouse as Christ loved the church? And none of these things involve any position, official position in the body of Christ, the family of God. But church building has as much to do with thought life, prayer life, motive, parenting, hospitality, and love for people as it does teaching Sunday school or working in the food bank or preaching or ushering or any other position, worship, whatever. And now he, he's, he discloses another kind of builder. If anyone's work is burned, he will suffer loss, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. Paul presents the possibility that someone there at Corinth, at the church there, could have his or her work burned up and suffer loss, will lose their rewards. Like a workman who's fine, somebody who's out there, a welder on the bridge, does the welds, and then the inspector comes along, and he says, nope, all these are bad. You don't get paid for all these. You lose your reward. You thought you had this much in your paycheck, but it's... This much is deducted because of bad, bad welds. Well, there will be Christians who will lose the measure of reward that they thought they had. Maybe diminished praise, position, privilege, I don't know, something. 
Maybe more shame before Christ's judgment seat. That I will agree with. When I go before the Lord and he does all this stuff, shows me all this stuff, yeah, I'm going to, oh, man, no. Oh, God, Lord Jesus, I'm so glad for grace and that you forgave me. But it, yeah, it, it, there's the indication we're going to have to look at it. Now, the loss of motivation, the loss of, of, gain, of gain, of reward, can be a greater motivation than the reward. It's like if my parents, when I was a kid, gave me $5 allowance, or for, maybe not allowance, but say $5 for waxing the car. And then my father comes along and starts taking a dollar away for each thing that I didn't do right. Oh, you know, it gives, I got the five bucks. And then he says, comes back and he says an hour later, oh, you know what? You didn't finish taking the wax off the back bumper, $2 back. Well, that's worse than if I never had it to begin with. It's, you know, and, and that's how it's going to be in heaven. There, there, we'll think we have all these rewards, but then we, we lose some. You know, if your dad offered you pizza to clean your room, but then he, and you, you get the pizza, but then you're about to bite into a piece, and he comes and he says, hey, I just looked at the room. No, takes the pizza away. That's worse than not having had that pizza there. You, you follow? Junk food. Our works may look and taste good, and they may fill our stomach. But when it's melted down, junk food is nothing but grease, sugar, calories, salt, and fat. So the next time you go to the donut shop or the drive through the local hamburger stand, think of the judgment seat of Christ. Oh, man, what a guilt trip to put on people. When all that grease and sugar and fat are melted away, there's no or hardly any nutritional value left. And I don't want to present a life full of spiritual junk food to Christ because it's going up in flames. We want to present him with a sincere quality of service, a servant's heart, loving those people around us, something that will survive the inspection test, and we receive the reward. He concludes with verse 15, he will suffer loss, but then he, that's, we've already gone over, but he himself will be saved, yet as through fire. The Corinthian who builds badly with cheap materials, yes, he will be eternally saved. That's not the question, but the phrase, as through fire, is an expression meaning that you escape with difficulty. You have a narrow escape from the fire. It's connected to the reference of the fire that tests the works of the Corinthians. And most likely, what scholars think is that back in the day, it was like saying today, saved by the skin of one's teeth. That's what it meant when it, it, it said, you know, yet as so through fire. It was probably a popular um, phrase in that day. And it further demonstrates the solemn nature of the judgment seat of Christ. Everyone who, who understands that Jesus is the foundation will be saved, but some are going to be saved by fire. They'll make it into heaven, but they'll smell like they, were in, they went to hell. They'll be warmed when they see Jesus' face, but they'll look around and they'll say, oh no, everything I did and I vaporized before those eyes of revelation. Now I have no crown to cast at his feet. But because God in Revelation 7, 17 shall wipe away every tear, there will be no tears in heaven. That's the good news. For what would we, would we, what, what would we shed tears for not for the bigger house we wish we had built not for the newer car we wish we had purchased not for the nicer clothes we wish we had worn but for the opportunities we missed to lay up treasure there it's not that we might not want to shed tears at uh, that judgment seat but we know once we're in heaven there will be no tears dress me up in my best suit said the man who knew he was about to die his wife complied now fill my pockets with gold, he said, and sew them closed so no one can steal them. When he died shortly thereafter, he went to heaven and was pleased to feel the bulges in his pockets. I made it. I did it, he exclaimed. I took it with me. Who said you can't take it with you? Look at this, he said to Peter, opening up his sewn pockets. And Peter said, why did you bring asphalt up here? Tar. You see, 
that which we're so interested for, in fighting for, worried about here on earth, is mere tar in heaven. Mere tar. And although the reference here is certainly the Bema seat, where the re reward will come, there's no doubt about that. But I think there may be a secondary reference to, the to this, to the fire the Lord allows to sweep through our lives presently. You're fired, your boss says to you. And now you get a chance to see how much of your character is gold, silver, and gems, precious stones, and how much is wood, hay, and stubble, how you handle that loss of a job, and ministry and relationships and on the job. Fires are going to break out all around you, people. I've been going through grass fires for close to 30 years in the ministry. That's, they, that's, they happen. I remember one happened when I was down at a... 25 years ago, probably at a pastor's conference, in, 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 an international pastor's conference in Southern Cal, and I get a call from an elder, oh, the church is on fire. I go, call the fire department. He goes, no, not that kind of fire. Uh, and I'm there, <laughs> there I am, you know, 600 miles away, 700 miles away. Well, what can I do? Well, you know, let it burn. And I found that when you sense a grass fire starting, it's a good idea to be careful before you grab your bucket and your shovel and your hose and you try to put it out in your own energy and by your own wisdom in life. If you have, a, if you have good people skills, if you're a good talker, a logical talker, you, you can meet with people, you can try to reason with them, and maybe you can even control the fire for a year or two. But more often than not, it'll explode eventually into flames anyway. And the, it'll be more devastating than it would have been if you had just allowed it to burn out back then. And when the fire comes in life, I'm slowly but surely learning most of the time, just let it burn out. It burns out on its own. And the more I might try to get involved, sometimes the messier it gets. You know, I come in with a hose and I hose it down, and the next thing, oh, that fire wasn't so big, but the mess you just made is. That fire we could have put, the fire department, we could have put out in a couple of minutes with a little extinguisher, but man, that hose you took to it. I remember one time I was over a girlfriend's house for dinner, and, and the frying pan caught on fire, and, I, you know, and, and she kind of freaked out and screamed, the fire, fire, and I looked, and the, you know, the flames were like that tall, and I just went over, and I, I knew you shouldn't throw water on it, and I saw this little carpet and I grabbed the carpet, and I took it, and I threw it and smothered the fire. Yeah, the man. <laughs> Didn't throw water on that thing. That would have been a disaster. Put that fire out. That carpet was worth $1,000. <laughs> was worth $1,000. Oh, 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 okay. Well, the house didn't burn down. Well, the house wouldn't have burned down anyway. Let them burn out. And then when the fire is over, poke around and see if any gold, silver, or precious stones are left to rebuild with. The fires of life prepare us for the future and eternity. And when it comes to the church, you are those precious stones, people, the rewards. Those who are here have been through the fires and are still here, precious stones, gems, gold, and silver. The reformer Martin Luther, not to be confused with Martin Luther King, but Martin, Martin Luther, the reformer of, 18, of 1483 to 1546, a long, long time ago, he's quoted as saying, there are two days on my calendar and two days only. Today and that day, the day. If we live like that, we can prepare for our eternal home. People come to this church from other Calvaries visiting, and I often hear, yeah, it's so much like our Calvary down in Southern Cal or our Calvary in Minnesota that we feel like home. Well, that's how it should be for us when we hit heaven. It shouldn't be, oh, you know, this is so strange, man. I, I feel like, a, a, you know, out of place here. It should be that because of our servant's heart, because of our love, because the fact that we will have a lot of reward because we have so much real stuff, real silver, gold, and precious stones, that when we get to heaven, we've already sent the materials up, the good materials, and the mansion that God builds will be with those materials, and we'll just say, we'll look around, oh yeah, okay, and 
look around heaven, yeah, well, here's, my, here's everybody I know, and, and we're at home. We're truly at home, not you know, at some destination that we know nothing about, that we're vacationing at, or, or you know, is some shock to us. But that's only, it will only happen if we're sending up the good stuff, the quality stuff, the stuff that's from a servant's heart, from a heart of love. Lord, we come before you this day, and Father, we know that this church has been known for its love, Lord, above all things. Not its numbers, not its programs, not the, the fanciness of the building, but throughout the decades, there's been few who have disputed that your love permeates this church, and people are constantly telling us and thanking us for it. And Lord, we thank you that it's by the grace of you, Lord, that we're able to do the things we do, Lord. Whether it be when the shoe boxes for Christmas for kids program comes along and we, we end up bringing in more shoe boxes than churches ten times our size. Whatever it be, Lord, that because of our love, whether it be the Hansi and Jen, the Jeanette collection, Lord, whether it be getting the fireworks project done so that we can give to the needy, Lord, whatever it be, it's because of your love. And Father, we know that when we get to heaven that we have sent up good things. And Lord, we do pray humbly, though, that we would be doing it correctly. We'd be doing it with the right materials and the right foundation so that when that inspection day comes, there'll be more reward than loss. And we thank you, Jesus, for these truths. In your name we pray. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right, God bless you. If you don't know the Lord, I don't see anyone here who doesn't know the Lord. You know who gets a lot of reward in heaven? Those who lead people to the Lord. They do.